so is everybody ready? <laughs> so today's lesson, um, we are talking about uh, elevated to influence. And we're talking about Esther. We're, this is the school lesson for tomorrow. And uh, as I always say, if you didn't study your lesson yet, now is a good time to know what your lesson is about. So, uh, and it, it was talking about Esther. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back. Um, well, I'm going to read the scripture for this Sunday, but I'm going to actually go back to last Sunday's lesson which was also about Esther. And we'll just kind of go and bring it up to date. It's kind of, sometimes if you miss last Sunday's lesson, it doesn't really make sense. So that's okay with everybody, that's what we're gonna do. Um, if it's not okay, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so uh, this lesson is coming from Esther chapter nine. Uh, if you have your Sunday school books, you can follow along. And if you don't, you can just listen. Uh, and it starts at verse one, and I'm just going to read this, the, the scripture that's in the book. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. It says, now in the 12th month, that is the month Adar, on the 13th day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put in execution in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, though it was turned to the contrary, that the Jews had ruled over them that hated them. The Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on such as sought their hurt. And no man could withstand them, for the fear of them fell upon all people. And all rulers of, all, of the provinces, and the lieutenants, and the deputies, and the officers of the king helped the Jews because of the fear of Mordecai fell on, upon them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house. And his fame went throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai waxed greater and greater. Thus the Jews smote all their enemies with the stroke of the sword and slaughter and destruction and did what they would unto those that hated them. Then said Esther, if it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews which are in Shushan to do tomorrow also according unto this day's decree and let Haman's 10 sons be hanged upon the gallery. And the king commanded it so to be done. And the decree was given at Shushan and they hanged Haman's 10 sons. For the Jews that were in Shushan gathered themselves together on the 14th day also of the month of Adar and slew 300 men at Shushan. But on the, on the prey, they laid not their hands. But the other Jews, that were in the king's provinces, gathered themselves together and stood for their lives and the rest from their enemies and slew their foes 70 and, and 5,000, but they lay not their hands on the prey. On the 13th day of the month, Adar, and on the 14th day of the same, rested day, and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Okay, so um, we're, like I said, we're gonna start at the beginning of Esther and kind of work our way through and hopefully um, we'll get through in time. And if not, uh, I ask the Lord to just let me say what needed to be said and it'll be said, Lord willing. Um, so Ahasuerus was the king and he reigned a large region of land. Um, and to put this into perspective, uh, this was during the time, it was after Daniel. And so the Jews were no longer in captivity per se, um, but it was before Ezra and Nehemiah. So they had not come back to their land, to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was still in, in destruction, but they were allowed to live in the, um, a lot of them, the Jews had decided to live where they were. Uh, and especially in Persia, because they were living so well, they were like, why would I go back? So this is where Esther was. Um, and so at the time, King Ahasuerus had a wife, Vashti, and he asked her, she was very beautiful, and he was having a feast, and everybody's eating and drinking, and, you know, he's had, he's got people from company in, you know how you've got company coming in. 
and he wanted to show her off. And so uh, Vashti, for whatever reason, decided she didn't want to come. And so um, the king decided, or his, his advisors decided that something had to be done. Um, and they decided that the king would no longer, um, she would no longer be able to come into the king. Why do you think, and anybody can answer, just unmute and answer. Why do you think that they decided that they had, why did they have to do something about that? Anybody? <laughs> Maybe because it was a, a sign of disrespect. Okay. So, um, uh, I'm sorry, was somebody else, somebody else want to say something? Yes, uh, it was a sign of disrespect, but what the fear that if she did it uh, to him, all the other leader wives would be doing the same thing. They'd be following suit and it will be a disrespect to to the men. Right. So um, they were watching, and whatever happened with King Ahasuerus, um, the other people are watching, and they would do the same thing. And so, um, especially if you're married, even today, people are watching to see how spouses treat each other. Right. And so um, 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 Deacon facing people are watching to see, you know, if you sit in the dining room, they're watching to see whether you say, uh, Sister Marine, bring me something to eat or whether you say, can you bring me something to eat, please? You know, and then when she put bring you the plate, they're watching to see if you say thank you or whether you just dig in. Right. They, they're watching to see how you treat each other. Because sometimes, you know, and a lot of times you say, well, it's none of their business what I do with my husband or what I do with my wife. But sometimes you don't know if people, if they're having trouble in their marriage or they don't, you know, they're kind of undecided what to do. You don't know if they're watching you to see how they should act in their own marriage. So you have to watch how you treat each other. You shouldn't treat each other poorly anyway but especially in public. And sometimes, you know, your spouse may ask you to do things that, um, cause she very, obviously she was uncomfortable or she didn't want to do whatever he asked her to do. And sometimes our spouses ask us to do things that make us uncomfortable, but it's all in how you react to that. You know, um, I remember one time Telly asked me to um, go and he knew this pastor and his wife wanted to meet me. And he said, well, you know, can you go meet her? She's asking to meet you. And uh, I'm not, I, I get kind of uh, um, anxious when I have to meet new people. I don't like meeting new people. <laughs> I'll just tell you. And people say, oh, that's what's wrong with them. I'm just, I'm just weird about that. I don't, I'm not too good with meeting new people. And so I, I kept saying, well, you're going to come, right? And he's like, no, you, you have to go by yourself. And I'm like, what do you, what do you mean? I got to go by myself? I got to meet this person by myself? What do you, you know? And, he, and there was a lot of, you can do it. It'll be okay going on. But I went and did it even though I was uncomfortable with it because he asked me to. And so sometimes as spouses, even though it may make you uncomfortable, there may be a reason why they ask you to do things. So. Um, and, and like I said, people are watching, so you have to be very careful how you respond. Um, even if you don't like that, don't respond in public. You know, wait till you off on your own. So anyway, obviously she didn't make the right decision and they kind of put Vashti away. And so now he wanted a new queen, somebody who was gonna, you know, be very beautiful, but, um, also be able to stand withstand what he needed as a queen. And so um, the, you know, they fit the decree out and, and I'm going through this kind of fast because like I said, this is last week's lesson. So they sent the decree out and Esther was one of the people that um, 
was chosen to go before, you know, to go with them to see if she could be the queen. Now, Esther and Mordecai, what was their, their relationship? What was their, you know, their, they were related to each other, but what was their relationship? I think he was her uncle. Uh, actually, I think he was her cousin. The cousin. Cousin. His his uh, her father was his uncle. I think that's how that went. Right. Okay. And um, and so Esther's parents had died, and Mordecai had taken her in, and so he loved her very much. He raised her, and he loved her very much. And you could tell that because when she went to the king's palace, he went with her to make sure that she was okay. And so um, to anybody who's thinking, um, sometimes we, through, through different circumstances, we have to take children in that are not our own, whether you adopt or whether they're foster children or whether they're um, children where some of my family member can't take care of them and you've got to take them in or their parents die or whatever. And so um, we'll see later on, you have to be careful how you treat these children when you take them in. You have to treat them just like they're your own. And I mean, just like they're yours. So that means if you have children and you take in someone else's child, you can't take your children to the mall when they go school shopping and they go to dealers and belt and everywhere else and get their school clothes and get their Air Force Ones from Foot Locker. And then you take the, the uh, foster child and they got to go to Walmart and get a pair of Dickies and some shacks and say, well, that's what you get. You know, you can't do that. Either everybody has to be treated the same way because children, they know when they're not being treated fairly or when they're not treat, being treated the same. They know that. I don't care how young they are. They know it. And so um, you have to be very careful. If you if you don't think that you're able to do it, then don't don't even, you know, let somebody else raise them or whatever. If you don't think that, because it affects them for the rest of their lives, they're going to remember that. And so um, Mordecai had taken Esther in and he sat there by the gate and he made sure that she was okay. And, and there was a process by which the, the, the women were, the young, I should say the young ladies, I don't know how old they were, but they were obviously young maidens, they were virgins. And so there was a process that took like a year, it was like a year long process that they had to go through and they had to purify themselves and put, you know, different spices and everything. Not Well, you know what I'm talking about, where they, um, different uh, smells and, and perfumes and things on, so that they were right for the king. And um, and so when it became Esther's turn, she was able, they were able to take whatever they wanted. And so she decided that she would only take what they advised her. She didn't want anything extra. And somehow this caught the king's attention. Not only that, but she was very beautiful also, obviously. And so she was the one that was chosen. Now, Mordecai, before she went in, he told her, he said, don't tell anybody who you are, that you were Jew. Don't tell anybody we're related, okay? Why do you think he told her that? Why do you think he told her not to let anyone know who she was? Okay, don't everybody talk at once. Okay. Yes, the, the, the easier answer is he didn't want anybody to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. He didn't want anyone to know. Um, and the Lord, um, at the time, it wasn't the right time for anyone to know that they were Jews. And it wasn't so much that, um, obviously, they knew that there were uh, Jews in the land, but obviously, the Lord had probably laid it on his heart not to tell right then. Some things we don't need to tell everything, right? Sometimes people, they, they, they 
you, you ever heard people say TMI, they give out too much information about themselves, right? And uh, Facebook is one of those places where people get on there. And, and I'm going I'm to tell y'all a secret about Facebook. I want everybody to listen. I'm going to tell you this big secret about Facebook that uh, people don't know. We can see you on Facebook, everybody. We can see you. People get on Facebook and they say and do all kinds of things and everybody can see you. Everybody can see what you're doing and they can hear what you're saying and what you're typing in. And I'm not on Facebook and I can feel, I still know what people put on Facebook. And you think that, you know, you're like, oh, I only have 19 friends, but I guarantee you 200 people know what you put on there. And so um, I, I, my advice to you, and you can listen or not, is if you wouldn't walk in church and say what you say, or look how you look, or act how you act on Facebook, if you wouldn't do it in church, don't do it on Facebook. Just don't. Just don't do it. Facebook, uh, you know, and I know this is going on Facebook, but so if you on Facebook and you looking at this, I'm going to tell you, everybody know your business if you put it out there. So the, don't come back and be mad at people because they know everything and they're talking about you. If you put it out there, they're going to talk about you. They're going to say stuff about you. But just don't put it out there. Keep some stuff to yourself. There's some things you just want to keep to yourself. So, Mordecai, it just wasn't really time for them to, to say right then what their relationship was. And, and I, at the time, sometimes when the Lord said, don't, I want you to do this, but don't tell anybody. And you may not know why. There was nothing wrong with Esther being a Jew. There was nothing wrong with that. But it just wasn't time for them to know that yet. And we'll see later on why. So, um, so Esther was chosen as the queen, okay? And so Mordecai, by him sitting at the gate and, and by him listening in, he had found out that people were plotting against the king. And he told, you know, Esther, he, made, he, he got the, the message to Esther and, and she told the king. And, and so they found out about this plot that somebody was plotting. And so um, they found out that it was Mordecai okay, that, that had told, okay, and so um, they kind of noted that right then, they didn't say anything then, but they made a note of, okay, and so there was another person um, named Haman, who was also, he was appointed, he was like the king's right-hand man, and he kind of came up through the ranks, okay, and when when he, he got this high office and he got the king's ring, which means that he had all the authority and the permission of the king, okay? And so he would go by and everybody had to bow down to him. Everybody had to bow. And this sounds familiar because we think about Daniel and the Hebrew boy. Somebody was always trying to, you know, want you to bow down to him. Um, sometimes people get in position and... I'm going to say this, this may offend some people. And if it does, I'm talking about you. So sometimes you get in these positions and you think everybody ought to bow down to you, right? You the man or the woman, and you better not call me brother. It's elder or it's bishop or it's overseer or it's minister. It's not brother anymore or is evangelist, or is missionary, or is whatever, because God forbid, I say Sister Jones when you're an evangelist, Lord help me if I call you sister. Oh my God, the world is coming to an end because I didn't say evangelist, right? People get like that. And to God, he doesn't, there's no separate heaven for different people, right? God don't care who you are. Right, I'm not going to a different heaven than uh, Bishop Wilson. Right, he don't get his own special heaven because he's a presiding bishop. Right, we all going to the same place. The Lord don't care who you are. 
So why do we care who each other, I mean, why do we make that distinction among each other when God said there is neither new Jew nor Gentile nor bond nor free, you know, and I understand that we have to have respect for each other, but remember that we all serve in the Lord. That's who we serve. We're not serving, you know, it's not for you to get a position and everybody got to bow down and do this for you, but it's all into the, we all working together. And you're supposed to be helping the other people come up and be saved. We're supposed to be all helpers to another, each other. Okay? So remember that when, you know, remember who when, when way back when you started coming to church and you were the, what we call the bench warmers, right? And then you start coming up. The other people, you know, everybody is all in one body. We are all one. Does that make sense? So um, we just we just have to be careful. So um, back to the lesson. So Haman was appointed, and because he rode by and Mordecai didn't bow down, he hated that man. I mean, he completely, he just went, he just, he couldn't even think straight. He hated him so much. And so he went home and and he just, it just bothered him to no end that this man did not bow down to him. It just, it just, he just couldn't get himself together. And so his wife and, and his, I believe it was his family, but I know it was his wife, um, came and, 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 and said, you know, um, you know what you ought to do. You, you, you need to go and build, you know, you know, you need to go and build a gallow. Gallow is where they go and uh, hang people. Y'all don't know that. Like when you play hangman, you make that little teeth and that's the gallon, right? Everybody's play hangman. So anyway, she said, you need to go and hang him. And so Haman decided that it wasn't going to just be Mordecai. It was going to be all the Jews. All of them got together. Okay. So um, sometimes our attitude about one person kind of skews all people, right? If I got something against uh, somebody in Elder Hummel Church because they jumped in front of me in line or whatever, then the whole, I can't stand anybody at Elder Hummel. The whole church is corrupted to me, right? I, I don't like none of them down. You know, you say that I don't, I don't like none of them people down there. I ain't going back because of that one person. So um, that's how Haman was. And so his family, uh, well, his wife, decided that this is what he ought to do. She she didn't say, well, you know, it's just one one man. I mean, you know, we got to be kind of careful with family too, because sometimes with family, you know how you say, oh, the blood is thicker than water. We stick together. Our family stick together. We, we, we the, you know, whoever, we the Joneses, we stick together. We all stick together. But when you're wrong, we don't stick together when you're wrong. I'm not going down with you. I, I, I told you. I'm not going to hell behind anybody. I don't care who you are. If you're wrong, you're wrong, right? Sometimes people stick together with family even when they do things that are wrong. And you can't do that. So um, so what did Mordecai, so once Mordecai found out that Haman was going to um, have put out this, this, this decree to kill all the Jews, what was Mordecai, what did he um, have the people to do? Anybody? I mean, what did, what did, what was Mordecai's solution? Right. Fast. Right. So the first thing that he did, and that's the first thing that our reaction should, should, to any problem should be, is to fast and pray, right? He didn't, you know, he didn't say, let's, let's all get our horses and our picket signs and go down there and form Jews' Lives Matter and hold them up and say, we, you know, that's not, that's not what his solution was. His solution was to fast and pray. And then he went to Esther and he was like, look, you got a problem. You know, they can ready to go kill all the Jews. And she, she was like, look, uh, uh, you know, go down. I think somebody told her 
that he was down there in sackcloth and she sent some clothes to him and he was like, no, that's not going to do it. You need to go to the king. That's what you need to do. And she said, well, I can't, I can't go in. The king has to call me in there and I haven't been called and I can't. He's like, look, remember who you are. Remember they hadn't told anyone. He said, you know, you're not going to escape either. They find out you were Jew, they're going to get you too. So you better go in there and do something. And so Esther called for everybody, all the Jews to fast and pray. I want everybody to fast and pray. And sometimes um, when we come up against situations, that should always be our first um, answer to the problem is let's fast and let's pray. Let's pray about it, right? Sometimes we talk first and pray later. That, that doesn't work out. You know, that's, that's not going to work. You can't talk first and pray later because then usually what you pray is, Lord, forgive me, right? When you talk first, then you got to say, Lord, please forgive me for saying that. Is that and the other? I should have came to you first. And now you done made a mess out of it. You got to pray your way out of that and then go back and find the solution. Well, you got to go to God first and, and, and fast and pray. And so now we go back to the question of why Mordecai didn't have Esther tell who she was from the beginning. That's the answer to the question. If, she had, if they had known who she was, uh, we don't know, she would not have been able to save her people from the destruction that was coming because she would have been numbered. Haman probably would have made a, a, you know, made a plan to get her too. And so that's why we can't tell everything. That's why we can't, if God gives you something, you can't tell everybody. You can't tell everything. Sometimes people try to talk you out of stuff that God tells you to do because it sounds crazy, right? And so that's why you can't tell everybody, you know, the Lord told me last night that I ought to do this, that, and the other. And they say, yeah, right. That, like that's the name of the Lord. I don't know who you think you are. And then you start saying, maybe it wasn't the Lord. Maybe I am crazy. And then you don't do it. Next thing you know, you know, that you haven't done anything that the Lord told you to do because you went to other people. Some, some things you need to keep to yourself. And so by her not telling everybody, um, who she was, they they didn't know that she was one of the people that they wanted to kill. They didn't know that. And so after, once she had the people fasted, she said, I'm going to go on in and, and see that I'm going to go in for my people. And they, they, you know, they said she was brave for doing that. And she was because if the king hadn't accepted her, she would have been, you know, taken off. And so she, what she did was she put her own self aside. And, and so um, when you in a leadership position, you can't be selfish. You can't be a selfish person. Everything is not about you, right? It's nothing actually, when in the Lord, nothing's about you. It's all about the Lord and what he wants. And so you can't, sometimes some situations you can't think about what's best for you, you have to think about what's best for the people. And so at the time, what was best for the people was for her to go before the king. And so God fixed it so that the king heard her. And, you know, she probably had, he had a little soft spot for her. Y'all know how it is with your spouse. You know, you got a little soft spot. They can go in and, you know, and sit with you and touch you just the right way. And you just all melt down and whatever you want to do. You know, y'all know how they go, you know. And so he had a little soft spot for, for Esther, and he allowed her to come in. Okay, so when Esther came in, okay, she didn't, right away, she didn't tell what Haman was planning. She didn't go right in hard charging, like, you know, look what he's doing and, you know, telling on him. You know how little children do, they come in and tell everything. She didn't go in and tell on him, right? She came in and she said, listen, uh, I'm going to have a feast. Can I have a feast? You know, the king's like, oh, sure. You know, that'll be great, you know. And so um, she requested a feast, and she wanted Haman to be there. And, and um, at this point, the king didn't know, he didn't really, she, she had to be careful as to how she approached him 
because the way that she came and approached him was in a way that was not threatening to anybody, right? It wasn't threatening. Haman was happy, you know. He, oh, look, the queen invited me in. He went and told everybody. And I, if all these people, and they, you know, they, they, the queen wanted me to come in. He didn't even know that she was a Jew, one of the people he wanted to kill, but he was just happy. Okay. And so, um, so, um, let me get out of, I just started talking, didn't even look at my notes. All right. So, when um, the queen invited them in for the feast, the king said, well, what do you want? Like, you can have whatever you want. And she said, well, I want another feast tomorrow. It sounds crazy, right? You go in on the feast and ask for another feast, right? Sound like, you know, why would you do that? But that night, uh, the king couldn't sleep. And be before we go into that, she had invited Haman, but he couldn't even enjoy it because he, you know, and it was a great honor that he was in there, but he couldn't even enjoy it because he hated Mordecai so much. Can you imagine having that much hatred for people, for somebody? How much energy that takes to hate somebody that much that you can't even be happy because you hate them that much? You know, and I hope, you know, I don't know if you've ever hated somebody that much. I hope you don't now. Now that you're saved, I hope you don't hate anybody that much. But it takes a lot of energy to maintain that kind of hatred. And so um, that night, um, King Ahasuerus couldn't sleep. What Does anybody remember what it was that he did? When he, somebody tell me that part of it, of what happened when he couldn't sleep. Because this is the reason why the Lord had her ask for the second feast, the series of events. And for y'all who are following along, I think we're in uh, um, chapter four. Um, Last week's lesson. I believe um, he had discovered uh, uh, the plot on his life that they was going to kill him. Uh, then uh, Mordecai had reported to him, and that's when he had discovered it that night when he fell asleep. I believe. Okay, so what happened was that night he he was looking through his record book. And that's why it's good kind of to, to remember people. He looked through his record book and he realized that Mordecai had saved his life. Remember I said before that they had kind of took note of it. They didn't really do anything, but somebody had taken note of what Mordecai had done. And so he was reading through it and he was like, oh man, somebody, somebody saved my life. I remember that, you know, and I don't know whether it was just a footnote in his head or whatever, but. He said, we ought to be do something with this person. What should we do? You know, and so he called his people together. Um, and um, asked them what he should do for uh, the man who, well, actually he called Haman in. He called Haman in of all people, right? He called Haman in. He said, listen. There's a man who we need to honor and he saved my life and he's brave or whatever he said. And he said, what do you think we should do to reward him? Now, Haman, because he was so conceited, he's thinking the king talking about him, right? He said, oh yeah, I think you should give him the crown and your clothes and, you know, put him on your horse and let him go through the town and everybody got to bow down to him. Some people, you know, they, they get stuff and they, they never satisfy with what they have. They want some more, right? And so Haman thinking it's him, he was like, man, they, I know he's talking about me. I'm his right-hand man. And, he, and so the king was like, yep, you're right. Let's do that. Go down there and get Mordecai and put the, put the, the crown on him and the coat and parade him around town. And so can you imagine the irony of the man that you hate. You, he couldn't even sleep at night. He hated Haman's, 
Now, I mean, Mordecai so much, he couldn't even think straight. And now he's got to lead this horse. And this man on this horse with the king's crown around the whole town, right? Can you imagine what Haman must have been thinking? I mean, he, he must not have had any teeth left because he had gritted his teeth so much. I mean, he, but he had to do it. And so, um, um, and at the time, <laughs> and at the time, Haman, when he was asking him what he should do, Haman at the time was putting those gallows in the courtyard for, for Mordecai. And that, I, it, you know, if you watch soap operas, you know, Young and the Restless, y'all know what they are, Bold and the Beautiful, whatever. It couldn't have been written any better than this. I mean, this is one of those scriptures that you read and you kind of imagine and you say, this, this, you know, it couldn't get any better than this. So um, Haman, after he had to go through this humiliation of having to take this man around town on his horse or whatever, he came home crying to his wife, Lord, have mercy to you, know what they made me do. Look what they made me do, this man Mordecai, you know. And so, um, uh, and so before, before I go into what, what comes next, what was Haman's um, decree of how the Jews were to be, how he was going to take care of the Jews? Because he, he, there was a way that he, he was going to have them taken care of. He wasn't going to kill them all himself. How was he going to have them all killed? You can unmute, unmute and tell us. Got to turn the camera on uh, whatever uh, his providences were, he was going to have all the um, his people uh, to round them up and kill them. Okay. So, thank you, Sister Maureen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, his plan was that he was going to have his his wherever his provinces were, he was going to have them kill the Jews wherever they were, and and so um, and the Jews by not being able to fight back, it was going to be a slaughter, basically. Um, he that's what he had planned on doing, and when you plan um, things that are evil against people, um. Sometimes, and, and some of the places, they were confused. They were like, what? Why would we do that? You know, but this was the decree that had been handed down. And um, sometimes when you, the, you know, when you're in a place and it seems like um, you say, man, uh, the Jews who were in those provinces were like, how are we going to get out of this? That's why they fasted and prayed. And the Lord had a plan for them the whole time. But you gotta, you gotta have faith, you know, and we say that a lot. We say you gotta have faith a lot, but then when it comes down to it, you know, it's like you forget all about that, right? And that's when you, um, now listen, again, I may offend some people and that's okay. Sometimes when you see people out and they say, there's this injustice, they're killing our young men and they're killing this and this is happening in the world and this is what's going on. We've got to do something, right? And then you get out there and the TV shows all these protesters out there and then here you are out there with, right? You out there holding up a sign with them and the bullhorn and, and you know, and, and all this stuff, you're out there with them. But don't you know, that some things God has so that he can show his glory, right? And so 
God, when he shows his glory, he don't want you to get the credit, right? He don't want you to come back and say, because I did this, this is what happened, right? That's not what he wants to happen. He wants it to be so that they say, this was nobody but the Lord. Nobody but God should could have done this. And so we've got to wait on the Lord for some things. Well, for everything, you got to wait on the Lord. You can't go out and try to change things on your own. That's not the way God wants you to do things. And so the people had already, they had fasted and they prayed and they knew God was coming. You know, he's on his way. So we got to wait, even though it seemed like time was coming short. And so um, now we're going to jump back ahead to Haman. He went home crying to his wife about how he had to take Mordecai through the streets and the gallows was all set up for him. And what are we going to do? And so um, the next day um, was the banquet. Esther's second feast was the next day. Okay. And, um, and so at the second feast was when Esther told the king about how Haman was planning to kill the Jews and Mordecai was going to be included, okay? Now, if she had told the king the first time around, right, he wouldn't have been so enraged about it because he had to know about how Mordecai had saved his life. That's what made him so enraged about the plot because here it is, this man saved my life and you plan on killing him, right? So y'all, y'all, can y'all see how that, how God had it planned out, how he had it planned where he, he had to wait until, Esther had to wait until the king had had that epiphany about Mordecai before she told what had happened, right? And so she finally told what um, the plan was, how Haman was going to kill um, uh, Mordecai. And this is at the time where she finally told the king who she was, right? Now, I don't know um, how many years she had been in the palace before she finally told him who she was. And, uh, but the king obviously realized that that included her, right? And so um, he left, again, this is one of those soap opera moments. He left the banquet and he was angry. You know, he was upset. So he, had, he got up and left. And so while he was gone, Haman went to Esther, right? And pleaded with her for his life, right? Because he knew that the king was angry and he fell on her bed because I guess they had the bed in the hall, in the banquet hall or whatever. So he fell on the bed and he's, play, he's you know, pleading with her and the king walks back in and he's in her bed. If you can imagine that scene, right? Um, it didn't look good. It just wasn't a good look, right? And so the king, you know, he was like, you're planning on killing Mordecai and now you got my wife too? I mean, what in the world are you thinking, right? And so then uh, there, it was nothing he didn't even want to hear. I don't even know what, if Haman even tried to explain himself, but he didn't want to hear it. And so um, he had... Haman hang on the same gallows that he had built for Mordecai. Okay, so um, sometimes when you plot, and I'm not going to say your enemy because this is something that we're to learn from, is when you plot against people, sometimes you reap what you sow anyway. And sometimes it come back on you. The same thing that you plotted for somebody else, it comes back, back to you the same way. And you end up getting what you plotted for somebody else. That's why it's, you you know you have to forgive people, and some things you just have to let it go. You know, some I was way back in my younger days. I was one of those people. I like to, you know, you get me. I'm gonna figure out a way to get you right. And it wasn't I wasn't a fighter, so I wasn't gonna hit you, but I was gonna, you know, think of a way. You know how people plan out all these little these little uh, traps and they trap you in there. And then, you know, that was me. I was one of those people, I would think of a way to get you back. But it's not good to do that with people because 
a lot of times you end up looking like a fool yourself. You know, you, you end up looking crazy yourself and you don't want to do that. So some things you just have to let it go, you know. And so Haman ended up being hanged on the same gallows that he built for Mordecai, okay? And so um, now this is getting into this Sunday's lesson. So if you don't know the answer, it's fine. What happened to all of Haman's things, his estate? What happened to his estate? This is going into chapter eight. Give me two more copies. Yes. Okay. So, and by his estate, I mean, remember um, Haman, if he was the king's right hand man, he obviously had money and he had land and all this stuff the king had given him, right? He had a wife too. Remember, the wife had been plotting with him, right? So, all of his things, all of that land and whatever it is that he owned went to Esther, right? And and so, um, so you say, well, he had a wife <laughs> and he had 10 children, right? It says it in the lesson. He had 10 sons, right? And so by right, you think, well, it should have went to his wife and, and his sons. But this is what happens. Uh, when you when you have a family member and they're doing the wrong thing and you instead of telling them to do the right thing you go along with the with the with the uh, when they're doing wrong you go along with them because some people will stick up for their child through anything no matter what they've done right and you have a child and he go down there you know you have a son most of the time it's son sometimes it's a daughter they go down there and rob rob somebody right, and get caught, and you in court mad with the people, the store owners, because they called the police, right? Those people, what they got to call the police for and try to put my child in jail, because he, he robbed them. You know, you don't, you, instead of saying, you the one got yourself into this, you should have been home, in the bed, or at work, or wherever they should have been, what were you doing down there anyway? Instead of telling them that, you go and get mad at the other people for calling the police like they ought to let your son rob him blind, right? And you go along with that and you think God is with you because you say God ain't going along with you for that. You pray, Lord, get him, get him out, Lord. Don't let him go to jail, Lord, please. And the Lord is saying, well, what you want me to do? What I can do is change your heart. You know, I can change, you ask me to, you know, the Lord is saying, I can change your heart, right? I can, I, all I can do is help them see the errors of their ways, right? And nobody wants to see their child go to jail, but you got to think about what you're asking the Lord to do, right? You can't uphold people in their wrong. You can't do it. And so Haman the state went to Esther. And then he called Mordecai in with Esther because now he knows that they're together, you know, and, and their family. And he gave Mordecai the ring that Haman had. And remember, we said that the ring symbolized that it was like the king's signature. So whatever you said, it was it couldn't be reversed. So that decree that Haman had put out with the king's ring to have all the Jews killed, the king couldn't just say, go back and say, OK, we're going to, you know, that that's not the law anymore. They can't go back and do that. Right. So um, what he did was he said, okay, Mordecai, Esther, what do you think we ought to do? What do you think we should do? And so what Mordecai did was he gave the decree that the Jews could fight their battle, the battle to fight back against their enemies, okay? And so that was the plan the whole time, okay? And so the Jews, by them being allowed to defend themselves, they were, uh, they were able to defeat their enemies, okay? And so now God had allowed all this to happen, right, to once again bring the Jews out, right, to show that he was their God. And so um, 
So they were allowed to defeat their enemies, okay? And um, and the people and the, the, the princes and, and all the advisors helped them fight their enemies, right? They It wasn't just them. They had some help too. You know, some people came in and helped them out. And so, um, you know, the uh, Mordecai was promoted pretty much to Haman's position, you know, and so, um, and and so um, the the Jews were no longer afraid, um, lived in fear for their lives, right? And so we can see how how Mordecai went from being um, the guardian to uh, an orphan, right? To being exalted to this position where he's the right-hand man for the king, right? Through Esther. And all they had to do was do it the way God wanted them to do it. And, and no, at no time did they do it their way. They always sought the Lord, right? They always fasted and prayed and let the Lord lead them into what they had to do, okay? And so um, it said even, and I, I noted this, that even um, many people converted to being Jews behind that. And so when you do things the way of the Lord, and this is what God wanted anyway, was people to come to him, right? That's the whole point. The whole point is not for you. It wasn't, the point wasn't for Mordecai to get the glory and get the king's ring, the whole point was that people started seeing the one true God. That was the whole point, right? And so that whole thing happened so that people could come to God, okay? Um, and, um, and this is in chapter nine. It was saying that even though they destroyed the cities, the Jews um, didn't take any of the spoil. You know how they say to the victor goes before. Y'all heard that that uh that saying. And so they they didn't go in and loot the city or anything like that. They were just free. And so um that's what um the book of Esther. I went through the whole book of y'all, whether y'all know it or not. <laughs> we went through the whole thing in like an hour. Um, but that's what the whole essence of what um, Esther was put there for. She was put in place so that God could get the glory and so that people could see the glory of God. Um, does anybody have any comments or anything that they want to say? Any questions? Uh, I just want to say uh, I thank you. Uh, praise the Lord for uh, everyone who came on. Uh, I appreciate you uh, coming on. And Lord willing, next time... Uh, we do this, we'll be in person. And and um that's and I, I thank the Lord. I prayed, I prayed to the Lord that I would say something to encourage someone. And uh, I know he answers prayer, so hopefully you were encouraged. Um and um so now uh that's it. You can dismiss. Thank the Lord.